a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Okay, hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth. Today it's uh, the next, I think the eighth reading of the wonderful book Martin Luther wrote in 1545 against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. And I just want to make a little comment because I didn't make many comments last reading. <laughs> Don't think that I'm going to rush through this video, uh, through this book. It's just that about what we wrote last time or what we read last time, there were not many comments of me for, for me to make there. And uh, at least not in the way that I understood it. You know, one of the most important parts above this book is, or about this book is, that I am in agreement with Martin Luther. He does not write many things that I cannot agree on, unless many other authors, where sometimes I am whether in disagreement or whether I have to correct them. I mean, that it took Martin Luther some time to understand that the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian, that the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. It's normal that it took him that time. Most people today don't even understand it, and when they understand it, they don't even understand the consequences. For Luther, his sanctification was a lifelong progress, like for us it is also. Justification, justification happens instantly, but sanctification is a journey, a long, long journey. And we have to understand Luther was all his life in the Babylonian captivity of the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, there was here and there a little leaven left in him. But who can speak himself free of that, huh? Not so many, I guess. So the point is, when I have to make comments because something is not clear, or when I have to make comments because I am in disagreement, I will. It is not my... Um, my goal to rush through this book and to read 10, 11, 12 pages every time we sit down for an hour. But when that happens, like last time, it just happens. You know? It's not planned that way. Anyway, because we were reading so many pages last time, I'm going to retreat one page. And I'm going to start with the last paragraph on page 208, where Martin Luther says, Oh, what more shall I say? They knew well, and still know well, that the whole of Christendom in the world has no sovereigns except solely our Saviour Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whom St. Paul calls the head of his body, which is all of Christendom, as we can read in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, and of course in many other places. They still know well today that Christians in the whole of the Orient are not subject to the Pope. They know well that they have not a single word of God in their favor, but everything against them. Yet they are such outrageous, shameless blockheads that they instigated consciously and knowingly the loathsome, blasphemous, idolatrous papacy against the strong testimony and admonition of their conscience, the whole world and all of Scripture. Moreover, they still maintain it, while at the same time they condemn as heretics all their predecessors before Boniface III, along with the whole of Christendom, which existed for 600 years before the Pope, including all the Holy Fathers and Councils, and all the Christians who have existed these 1500 years up to the present day, 
in the lands of the east. I'm going to make a little comment because I don't know if I did that last time, but y you heard me saying about this 1260 year or day prophecy, three and a half years, 42 months, the reign of the Antichrist, that <coughs> authors like Alexander Hislop, Henry Gretton Guinness, and in this case also Martin Luther say that this 1260 day reign was from 606 through 1866 and the SDA is teaching 538, 1798. Now I don't say that 538, 1798 did not happen, but you, I had a little conversation with Brett Norman the other day and maybe he will put that out as a video and then of course I will put that out on my channel too, I don't know yet. It was just a Skype conversation, conversation and we were also speaking about that because I'm reading here about Boniface III again so I have to bring that up one more time. Listen, I don't say that it is quote-unquote diabolical to teach 538, 1798 as the 1260 years. My point is that There are reasons to believe that maybe both dates are possible. 538-1798 and 606-1866. The question that one has to ask is the following. The Pope has two keys. One is for the spiritual power, the golden one, and one is for the temporal power, the silver one. It is, I think, generally agreed on that 538 was the time of the temporal power. Yeah? Because that was all only when the Pope or the Bishop of Rome had been given power in Europe, in the western part of the kingdom of the Roman Empire. Yeah? 606 is the time when the Emperor Phocas, who was in the east, gave the spiritual power to the Bishop of Rome over the whole quote-unquote Christian church, over the whole Orthodox church, yeah? Western and Eastern. So, where you have in 538 the temporal power, you have in 606 the spiritual power. They were obviously not given at the same time. Now, when we speak about Revelation 13, it says one of its has one of its heads were wounded to death, or as were wounded to death. You know what I mean. Don't nitty picky here. The point is, when the temporal power has been given in, five, uh, in 538, and the spiritual power has been given in 606, then only one of the end dates can be right for the wound that has been afflicted to one of the heads, because one of the heads is temporal power and one other head is the spiritual power. That's at least how I understand that. We can discuss about that in the comment section, but that's my understanding of it. And you cannot say, well, 538 was the, spirit, uh, was the temporal power given, but in 1866 was the temporal power taken away. And I think we can all agree on that the spiritual power of the Pope has never been taken away, but the temporal power. And we know that because, first of all, as the Seventh-day Adventist teaching is 1798, they say General Berthier from Napoleon went into Rome and took the Pope captive, and he died a little later in captivity, and that is the end of the temporal, uh, of the temporal power, they claim. And then you have the other claim of 1866, where the French protecting troops left the Vatican, left the Vatican without any protection, and Garibaldi could form his Italian Republic and end the temporal power of the Pope. But the problem is, you cannot start in 538 and then go to 1866, because that doesn't match 1260 days. So there's a little dilemma in understanding. So I don't say that 538-1798 is wrong, but I say that 1866 for sure ended the temporal power of the Pope. Show me anything that happened after 1798 where you can understand from that the temporal power of the Pope ended in 1798. As far as I know, even in 1814 he reinstalled the Jesuits. 
the Pope was as powerful as ever. Okay, that one Pope that was taken captive in 1798 by Berthier was not, but all the others, he still had temporal power, the kings were still listening to him. Why did you have in the same century, a little bit later, the Monroe Doctrine from the United States of America? That was to limit the powers of the Pope, at least in the United States of America, by President Monroe. We really have to think about this historically and come to a consensus that both dates, 538-1798 and 606-1866, resemble 1260 days. And not to say that one is right and one is wrong categori categorically, but to come to an understanding how these dates fit in the prophecy, so that we can have a right historic understanding. But one thing is sure, and this all in prophecy, all prophecy scholars agree on, and that is that the temporal power was taken from the Pope, not the spiritual, and that the temporal power was made manifest again with the starting of the Lateran Treaty in February 1929, when Mussolini gave the Vatican back its temporal power, because the Republic of Italy accepted the Vatican as its own kingdom, and by that the Pope was accepted as king and the Vatican City is his kingdom and that gave him back his temporal power. That is without any discussion. Okay? So every time when Martin Luther he speaks about Boniface the Third and mentions him as the quote unquote first Pope and every everyone before them just the Bishop of Rome, like Gregory the Great, who we know did that um that quote that he said, the Bishop of Rome, or the Bishop who will take the title Universal Bishop, will be the precursor of Antichrist before him. Uh, well, Martin Luther also has that quote-unquote misunderstanding, in my opinion, and that's what I commented on, uh, that these bishops uh, were rightful Christians in his eyes, or in his understanding, and I deny that. There was no rightful Christian bishop in the church from the time of 321 after the baptism of the, the holy uh, of the holy of the pagan roman empire with christianity on through constantine and even then in the few centuries before that apostasy was luring and in the churches so but i don't want to go into a very very long discussion about that because you see now is a comment that i really have to make and that's even about something that i read last time but this is a very important point to me, because I don't want to be understood as someone who bashes the SDA, but I'm going to tell you that a lot of things that the SDA teaches are not completely righteous. And, um, well, then you have to think about it. You know, people like Walter Feit, people like uh, Bill Hughes, why do they never mention the period of 606 through 1866? Because they don't know it? I don't believe so, because Walter Feit so often cites Henry Gretton Guinness of his work, Romanism and the Reformation, where I took the quotes of that, that I don't think that he doesn't know that. But if you willingly don't speak about something that you know, that means that you don't say everything that you know, and that means that you hold back, and that is the same as lying, and that is not christian -y. And those are the things that I just want you to take discernment on, to be vigilant for yourself, and to weigh everything against the Bible. And when you have knowledge of a Bible prophecy that nobody else speaks about, well then the question is, why does nobody else speak about it? Because you are wrong, or because you are right and nobody else wants you to know? That's the question that I'm asking. Why does nobody out there speak about the period of 606 through 1866. Why does nobody ever mention Emperor Phocas and he giving the uh, spiritual power to the Pope in Rome, also over the Eastern Church in Constantinople in 606-607? That's the question. Why does nobody mention that and those 1260 days? <coughs> Okay.
Okay, I'm going to continue now in my paragraph here. Where the papacy is an article of faith, and such an important necessary article as the Pope bellows in all his decretals, basing his claim on Matthew chapter 16, it is certain, it is certain that, quote-unquote, St. Augustine and, quote-unquote, St. Cyprian, and the quotes come from me, Jörg, not from Martin Luther, indeed all the apostles and all of Christendom in the world for over 1500 years must be heretics and eternally damned. And along with them, Christ himself, who taught them these wicked heresies through his Holy Spirit, no one has been saved nor become holy except the papal Christians. Well, that's a way that you can call Catholics. Papal Christians. You have biblical Christians and you have papal Christians. <laughs> Which one do you choose? A pope has the perfect right to make such a judgment, and if he does not dare to speak such a verdict, he should not be pope. Well, and if you do not dare speak the truth, you should not call yourself a Christian, not a teacher, not an evangelist. And I call myself a lover of the truth, and I speak of such a verdict and other verdicts. And, my, uh, and Michael and Martin Luther says a pope has the di has the perfect right to make such a judgment, and if he does not dare to speak such a verdict, he should not be pope. But enough of this juristic understanding against the pope. We want to see how Christ's word in Matthew chapter 16 should be understood in a truly Christian way and how masterfully the Pope quotes them as the basis of his papacy. And by the way, uh, the Bible quotes in this book come, if I don't mention otherwise, directly out of this book and I don't check the quotes of this book against the King James and if I say I'm going to read from the Bible directly, then it is always the King James, of course, that I cite. But that Bible, of course, was not in existence at Luther's time. And when I cite from the German Bible, you're not helped with that because that you don't understand. <laughs> anyway, in John verse 6, verse 63, the Lord says, quote, The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, unquote. Accordingly, the words in Matthew 16 must also be spirit and life, namely when he says, quote, On this rock I will build my church. Unquote. Build must here mean a spiritual, living building. Rock must, rock must be a living, spiritual rock. Church must be a spiritual, living assembly. Indeed, so alive that all of it lives eternally. For the flesh is of no avail, etc., as we can read in John 6.63. It dies and does not live eternally. Now, this rock is solely the Son of God, Jesus Christ, of whom the scripture is full and no one else. And we Christians know this full well. We Christians know this full well. The Catholics don't. To build or to be built on this rock is something that cannot be done with laws or good works. For Christ is, Christ is not grasped by hand or works, but must come through faith and word. Thus, the church cannot, through itself or its own works, make itself spiritual or living. Instead, it is built on this rock through faith, and thus is spiritual and living as long as it remains built on the rock, that is, until eternity. You see, <coughs> you see from this that Christ means in this saying exactly the same thing as he says in John 11, verse 25, quote, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall never die. Unquote. And again, 
In John 8, verse 51, he says, quote, If a man keeps my saying, he will never die. Unquote. And, in summary, this text, Matthew 16, speaks of faith. He who has faith is built on this rock, as one says, quote, He who trusts God has built well. Unquote. Note this well, I say, that in Matthew 16, Christ speaks of faith and not of our works. For thereby it will become evident what a little pious panzer, a prancer the Pope is. Yeah? He who trusts God has built well. That's a nice title for the video. Eh? I took the same in German in the time. Wie Gott traft, heet wel gebaut, was the title in German. So, he who trusts God has built well. Note this well, I say, that in Matthew chapter 16, Christ speaks of faith and not of our works. For thereby it will become evident what a little pious prancer the Pope is. Okay. <clears throat> Thus, St. Peter himself, whom the scoundrels would have liked to make Pope in Rome, or even Christ himself, as Platina does, we read this in a little footnote, that Luther regarded Platina as the prototype of papal historians. And we can read that in Schaeffer, uh, History of Protestantism, I think is the book that Schaeffer wrote. Now, repeat the sentence in the, in the whole. Thus, then, St. Peter himself, whom the scoundrels would have liked to make Pope in Rome, or even Christ himself, as Platina does, interprets it in 1 Peter 2, verses 3-5, through 5, quote, You have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Come to him, to that living stone, rejected by men, but in God's sight, chosen and precious. And like living stones be yourselves built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Unquote. But soon afterwards, St. Peter proves through the prophet Isaiah 28, verse 16, that building on the stone or rock is faith in Christ, saying, quote, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and he who believes in him will not be put to shame. To you, therefore, who believe he is precious, but for those who do not believe, it has become the head of the corner, and a stone that will make men stumble. Even to them that stumble at the word, and do not believe him upon whom they have been founded. 1 Peter 2, verses 6 through 8. Peter points up the word belief so often that there can be no doubt that building on this rock is nothing else than believing in Jesus Christ. You know, the Roman Catholic Church twists this verse and says, when Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church, because they say that Peter is Petra, the rock, which is just, Petra is just a pebble, a little stone. Um, the point is that the Roman Catholics, and especially the hierarchy, the Curia and the Popes, all interpreted that way, that Peter was that stone. But Peter was a fallible man, and Christ knew that. There were numerous times, or there are numerous times in the New Testament that you can read that Christ says even to them, to, to his disciples, how little they are in their belief, yeah? in their trust. And man is always fallible. The only unfallible man that ever walked the earth was Jesus Christ himself. For the rest, all men are fallible. So, when you have two working brain cells, how would you ever come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ would actually build his church on a fallible man? 
Well, if Jesus Christ would do that, Jesus Christ would not have been the unfallible God that he is. You understand that? It is impossible. Jesus Christ building his church on a fallible man? No, but he builds it on the faith. On the faith that St. Peter has. On the faith that all the twelve apostles at that time have. Because he speaks to all the apostles, not only to St. Peter. St. Peter is just the speaker for all the apostles. I think we come to that a little bit later in this book. You will understand that. But when Jesus Christ says, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, he means on that faith that St. Peter has. And that faith, that is the rock, and the rock is Jesus Christ. Peter points up the word belief so often, Martin Luther says, that there can be no doubt that building on this rock is nothing else than believing in Jesus Christ. St. Paul too, in Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22, agrees with St. Peter. Quote, so then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit, unquote, etc. He continues. This is a very important sentence that we have just read. In this, or in these few words of St. Paul, we see that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the temple. We are the temple, is another place in the Bible it is said. Uh, the temple of God is, uh, is our body. We are the temple of God. We are all, how do you call that? Um, we are all stones that are used to build the temple. And when you take all the stones together, including the cornerstone on, on that the temple is built, Jesus Christ, then you have the temple. That temple that you can read of in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, that the Antichrist will sit in and exalt himself above everything that is God. Meaning that the Antichrist comes out of the true congregation, out of the church. And this is what St. Paul here says in other words. Let me repeat this here. This is as it is written in the book, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers or sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is joined together, and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Unquote. So the point that I want to make is that we are all bricks. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone and we are all bricks. And now you bring the chief cornerstone and the bricks together and you build what? A temple. A spiritual temple. And that's what we are part of. And out of that temple comes the Antichrist. That is the true understanding that you have to have when you read Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now continue in the book. All this is to be noted carefully, Martin Luther says, so that we can treat with contempt the filthy, foolish twaddle that the Pope presents that the popes present in their decretals about their Roman church, that is, about their devil's synagogue, as we can read in Revelation 2 verse 9, which separates itself from common Christendom and the spiritual edifice built up on this stone and instead invents for itself a fleshly, worldly, worthless, lying, 
blasphemous, idolatrous authority over all of Christendom. One of these two things must be true. If the Roman church is not built on this rock along with the other churches, then it is the devil's church. But if it is built along with all the other churches on this rock, then it cannot be lord or head over the other churches. For Christ, the cornerstone, knows nothing of two unequal churches, but only of one church alone, just as the children's faith, that is, the faith of all of Christendom, says, I believe in one holy Christian church, and does not say, I believe in one holy Roman church. The Roman church is and should be one portion or member of the holy Christian church, not the head, which befits solely Christ, the cornerstone. If not, it is not a Christian, but an un-Christian and anti-Christian church that is a papal school of scoundrels. This was a very, very important part of the book. You could also say it in other words. You could also say whether the Church of Rome is the true Church and the Pope is the Vicar of Christ on earth or he is Antichrist. You cannot have it both ways. But for the Church of Rome not to be the Antichrist Church, for the Pope not being the Antichrist, or the Papacy not being the Antichrist, he has to submit to the power of Jesus Christ. And accept that he, the Pope, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the whole Roman Catholic Church, is not above other churches. And the Pope is not the head of the Church, because the Bible clearly says that Jesus Christ is the head of the Church. You cannot have it both ways. The Pope is either the Antichrist, or he is the true God on earth. Well, how can you make your decision whether he is the one or the other? It's very simple. Just go to the Bible. And when the Spirit when the Pope speaks according to this Gospel, then he is a man of God. But he does not speak according to that Gospel, does he? You know, there's a little video clip of about a minute. I'm going to work in one of the Hour of the Two shows coming. I'm going to work that in. Where there is a, a German bishop speaking about the fact that Pope Francis on the plain agreed with the doctrine of justification of Martin Luther. And then the bishop said, when asked what he thinks about this, he said, we have had already a quotation ex cathedra of the doctrine of justification, and that was on the Council of Trent. When the Pope speaks in that plain, he does not speak ex cathedra. So, in other words, he is lying in your face, and he knows it, and they all know it, and they admit it. They don't even hide it anymore, but you don't understand it. And with you, I mean the majority of the people out there. I know no men or women in particular, but in general, you know. I'm going to work that uh, little clip video in, into one of the coming shows of Hour of the Truth, so keep an eye on those. I do two less of these shows on Hour of the Truth, because I'm so busy with this other stuff. But what we just read here, I think it is absolutely so important. Martin Luther says, and that's why I'm going to repeat it, we have to really understand this, we have to dissect this little sentence, and we have to really understand it to the point. One of these things must be true, Martin Luther says, because if there are two things, there is only one that can be true. One is white and one is black. One is true and one is lie. One of these things must be true. If the Roman Church is not built on this rock, along with the other churches, then it is the devil's church. 
But if it is built along with all the other churches on this rock, then it cannot be lord or head over the other churches. For Christ the cornerstone knows nothing of two unequal churches. What, why does he say unequal churches? Well, because the one church lifts itself up above the other. But all the churches in God's sight and Jesus' sight are equal. We are all equal. We are all brethren. We are all brothers and sisters. And Christ is our head. There is not one brother standing above the other. Oh, the one maybe have a title, an academic title or whatever, and the other does not, but that doesn't make him better. Because when you're a professor of, I don't know, teaching science, and you don't have a peasant that produces bread, you have nothing to eat and you're going to die with your professorship, right? What good does it do you? The one needs the other. As we need each other in our society, like we who don't produce anything need the people who produce because we are all consuming the things produced. If you take one away, the whole system breaks up. Huh? We are all the same. But the Pope says, nay, I am not the same. I am above all the others. My church, my Roman Catholic church, stands above all the other churches. Because I, the Bishop of Rome, have been given power, <laughs> whether temporally, 606, or spiritually, have been given the power, 606, again, Pope Boniface III then, by Emperor Focus, have been, uh, 538 the first one, 606 the other one, have been given the power over the whole congregation, over the whole churches of the quote unquote world at that time. The Roman Empire, the Eastern and the Western Empire, the Pope of Rome coming from the Western Empire, has been given by Emperor Focus in Constantinople the power of the Church of the East in Constantinople and the Church of the West. That's what he claims. And if it doesn't work by him having it received in the temporal way, then he says, I received it through Matthew 16. But we've just learned that he does not have, that he did not receive it through Matthew 16 because it said, to you therefore who believe he is precious, but for those who do not believe it has become the head of the corner, a stone that will make men stumble, even to them that stumble at the word, and do not believe him upon whom they have been founded. Peter points up the word believe so often that there can be no doubt that building on this rock is nothing else than believing in Jesus Christ. So what we are reading here today, or what we are reading here right now, it says one of these things must be true. If the Roman church is not built on this rock, on this faith, along with the other churches, the churches of Ephesus, the churches of Constantinople, the churches of Smyrna, the churches of Laodicea, then it is the devil's church. But if it is built along with all the other churches on this rock, then it cannot be Lord or head over the other churches. Because then all churches are equal and Christ is the head and not the blasphemous vicar of Christ. For Christ the cornerstone knows nothing of two unequal churches but only of one church alone just as the children's faith. That is, the faith of all of Christendom says, I believe in one holy Christian church. It does not say, I believe in one holy Roman church. The Roman church is and should be one portion or member of the holy Christian church, not the head, because the, the head befits 
solely Christ, the cornerstone. If not, it is not a Christian, but an un-Christian and an anti-Christian church that is a papal school of scoundrels. Anti-Christian church means against Christ and instead of Christ. Do you get it now why it means also instead of, in place of Christ? Because the Pope elevates himself in the place of Christ who says, I am the head of the church. We are all brothers and sisters. And Jesus Christ is the head of the church. His church. And when the Pope says, I am the head of the church, then he is anti-Christ, putting himself in the place of Christ. That is anti-Christ. Now let us take up the text of Matthew chapter 16 itself and see how strongly it supports the Pope who so proudly and firmly insists on it, even against his lawyers. Matthew chapter 16, verses 3 through, uh, 13 through 14. And um, there is a little footnote here which says, uh, Luther's exegesis of this passage in annotations on the other chapter of Matthew, annotations in Alicot Capita Matei. So this is taken of a work from Martin Luther from 1538, the quote that we read here from Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and 14, Matthew speaks thusly, quote, Jesus questioned his disciples, saying, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, unquote. Very, very important part of Matthew chapter 16. Let's read it again. Jesus questioned his disciples, saying, this is Jesus speaking, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, meaning his disciples, all twelve were together, and they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now this should not know uh, this should not now be followed any further. <laughs> you can read about it in Saint Jerome. Um, that is in the commentary of the Gospel of Matthew in the uh, Commendatorium in Evangelium Matei, um, another work where you can read about that. And I don't even turn to the works of quote unquote Saint Jerome. But anyway, you can read about it in St. Jerome, who interprets it very well. How flesh and blood cannot say anything about Christ, even though it sees the great miracle of Christ and esteems him highly. Furthermore, Christ does not ask what the people think, but what they themselves, the disciples, think of him, and says, who do you say that I am in verse 15? Now, here it gets interesting. Very, very interesting. And you really have to pay attention to get the point. Notice here that he asks all of them, yeah, 12 disciples, all of them together. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks. Then Simon Peter said, quote, You are Christ, the Son of the living God, in verse 16. Now, Peter gave this answer on behalf of all the apostles. For when a crowd is asked something, and Jesus addressed all twelve apostles at that moment, they cannot all reply at once. Rather, one must speak for the sake of all, as is said. Quote, Two can sing at once, but they cannot talk at once. Yeah? That's a German proverb. 
In German it says, Zween mögen miteinander singen, aber miteinander können sie nicht reden. This comes from the German Sprichwörtersammlung of, uh, collection of proverbs. Yeah? Two can sing together, but they cannot talk together. They can sing at once, they cannot talk at once. Yeah. You have that. A, a duo can sing together, but without preparation, speaking the same words together, not possible. That's why when you are in school and the teacher asks a question to the whole class, what do you have to do before you answer? Remember, you have to raise your arm. And then the teacher chooses you and when, you, when he asks a question like Jesus does, that they are all in agreement with, then the one who is chosen speaks for all the children, for all the pupils in the class. <coughs> Sorry. So, two can sing at once, but they cannot talk at once. That is why the fathers, Augustine, Cyprian and Chrysostom, rightly say that St. Peter was the mouth of the apostles and answered in the name of all, for they had all been asked and owed an answer. This is the point. Now, the Pope takes this and turns it 180 degrees around. The Pope says that Jesus only addressed Peter and that Peter answered and that therefore Peter is the rock on that he will build his church. That is the Pope's explanation of it. But when we read the Bible as it is written and we understand the Bible as it is meant by God to be understood and we <coughs> Oh, sorry, I had to cut there. Uh, now I have to pick it up again, I'm sorry. <laughs> when we read the Bible and understand the Bible as it, as it was meant by, by God, then we know that Jesus Christ here addressed all his apostles, all his disciples at the time. Huh? They were disciples, they were followers of Christ. Because he was gathered with them together, and he asked the question to all of them, now, at that time, those people had quite an education, and they know that it is not nice when one speaks above the other. So, therefore, one had to be the mouth of them all, and that mouth was Peter. And that's all. Therefore, nothing has been promised to Peter that has not been promised to the others. The point is that the Pope totally turns this around, this teaching, and makes it look and sound the way that he is the only righteous successor of Peter who has been given the power of the keys at this moment, because only Peter said in reply, Where does it say here? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Only Peter says it. That's what the Pope claims. But the understanding that Martin Luther wants to give us here, that we, the way that we have to understand the Bible is that Peter said that, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, but not of only his own conviction, but as the mouth of all the twelve disciples. So I'm going to read this little part in the book again. Christ does not ask what the people think, but what they themselves. Huh? So he doesn't care about all the people in Judea at that moment. He wants to know what they say, the disciples. What do they say? What do they think? His disciples of him. And says, who do you say I am? Now, you is a word that you can address one person at, and you can address a whole bunch of persons at. So when Jesus, the teacher, is standing in front of his disciples, 
and asking that question, what do you think, does he take anyone out there in particular, is he in a private conversation with only Peter or with only one of the disciples, or is he addressing all the disciples? Well, I think the latter applies, right? Who do you say that I am? Notice here that he asks all of them together. Who do you, all of you together, who do you twelve, my disciples, say that I am? And then Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter gave this answer on behalf of all the apostles. For when a crowd is asked something, they cannot all reply at once. Rather, one must speak for the sake of all. As I said, two can sing at once, but they cannot talk at once. That is why the fathers, Augustine, Cyprian and Chrysostom, rightly say that St. Peter was the mouth of the apostles and answered in the name of all, for they had all been asked and owed an answer. You know what Jesus Christ could have done also, to make it even more clear, for the even the biggest scoffer and doubter to be understood? He could have said, What do you, Jude, think I am? Or do you say I am? And what do you, James, say I am? And what do you, John, say I am? And what do you, Peter, say I am? He could have addressed them on by one by one, and he would have gotten twelve, twelve times the same answer. But he didn't do that. He addressed them all at once, and Peter was the mouth of the apostles and answered in the name of all, for they all had been asked and owed an answer. This is why the Pope here lowers his guard and builds on the rotten foundation that because St. Peter alone replied he was the Lord over the other apostles of the Pope and the Pope over all the world. You get it? Read it again. This is why the Pope here lowers his guard. And um, there is a little footnote in here, but um, that's, not so, that's not important. This is why the Pope here lowers his guard and builds on the rotten foundation that because St. Peter alone replied, he was the Lord over the other apostles and the Pope over all the world. Isn't there another place in the Bible? I don't have, I don't want to look this up right now. I'm asking yourself and do your own research. Isn't there another place in the Bible where there are one or two disciples who think that they can stand above the others and uh, say, uh, take us to your right side in the, in, the, in the throne of your kingdom? Something like that, you know? Is there any place in the Bible where Jesus accepts that one disciple is standing above another? Is there any place in the Bible that you know of and that you can cite and that you can write me in the comment box if you deny what I'm saying here, that Jesus Christ prefers one disciple above another or makes one head above another? Is there any biblical reference to that Peter or any other disciple or later on apostle had been, he had been made head of the other disciples or apostles that you know of? Well, I don't know about it, but the Pope says, because here the Pope lowers his guard and builds on the rotten foundation, that because St. Peter alone replied, he, St. Peter, uh, he, the Pope, was the Lord, uh, no, he, St. Peter, was the Lord over the other apostles, and thereby the Pope, because he is the successor of Peter, is the Lord over all the world. This is the way we have to understand the sense. I'm going to read it again. This is why the Pope here lowers his guard and builds on the rotten foundation, not on the rock, but on a rotten foundation, on sand, that because St. Peter alone replied he was the Lord over the other apostles, he, St. Peter, and thereby the Pope, who claims to be the apostolic successor of Peter, is Lord over all the world. There it is clearly in the text that Christ does not ask St. Peter, who do you say that I am? But he speaks all. He asks all all his disciples, saying, 
who do you say that I am? And St. Peter had to reply for all of them, and his reply had, at the same time, to be the reply of all, just as it happens in worldly and domestic spheres, when a servant, a town clerk or secretary is the spokesman for the council, for the community or domestic stuff, but he is not thereby the lord of the council, community or domestic staff or of the city. Or a lawyer or chancellor may speak the words of the emperor, king or prince, but is a long way from being emperor, king or prince himself, just as the pope, from these words of St. Peter, wants to be lord over apostles and the churches of all the apostles. That is rotten, I say, and the Pope will not last long if he does not bring up something better, as he will do now, as follows. Quote, and Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 through 20 Now we have come to almost and fulfilling of an hour of the book reading. And of course, you know that I will not go into dissecting this very last paragraph now. Instead, I will next time retreat to the middle of page 312, read this paragraph again, the last paragraph on page 312, and the very first on page 313, and we can get into this, and we can understand why Martin Luther says here, that is rotten, I say, and the Pope will not last long if he does not bring up something better than what we've just read about, verse uh, 15 and 16 in Matthew chapter 16, but as he will do now, as follows, because now the Pope takes Matthew chapter 16 verses 17 through 20 and twists them that they suit his agenda. That's what he will do with the reading that I just did. When Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will, very important, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We go into dissecting this in the next, the ninth reading of the wonderful book of Martin Luther against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. For today, I thank you for watching, listening and commenting. And until next time, Jörg from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye bye. <laughs>
Oh. 